Hey everybody, um, it's been a little bit, a little while, but I just want to do a video about um, this film I watched, a quick video uh, called A Quiet Passion, and it's one I just heard of, I don't know, I just stumbled upon it online, it's a biopic on Emily Dickinson, and I have to say it's actually probably the best biopic I've ever seen on a writer at least. Um, the, the writing is very witty, it's very, uh, very, very well acted, and the characters are not just there to move the plot forward. But um, I, Emily Dickinson for me was the first poet I ever read in high school. This is, I bought this journal when I was, uh, I think I was 17, and I spent my own money on it, like my babysitting money, and I purchased this from, is it B. Dalton? bookstore. I think I think they were that's what they were called. They were small bookstores that you'd find in the mall. And I paid full price for this. And um, I also of course have her complete poems which I have read over. And when I was young, early in my my writing days, you know, I never had any interest so much then to write in prose. I was always more interested in poetry. And she was the very first poet I ever read to such a degree and what 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 it was about her poems was their ability to sort of get me to see a different perspective and her ability to uh, you know make these connections between um, you know these illogical leaps and it sort of you know it just got me reading differently and so I saw this film and um, Cynthia Nixon plays Emily Dickinson the older Emily Dickinson and um, I think Emma Bell is, um, plays the younger Dickinson. And this is a very funny, very witty film. Um, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more done into the creative process, but um, this is a two hour film and it is, it's very, very well done. It, they labeled it as a romance, but it's not a romance. I mean, not not like some Julia Roberts movie. It's it's romantic in the sense of um, her death obsession. Because um, one of the films, one of the things the film does really well, is not only develop her siblings. Like Lavinia and Austin are very well developed characters, especially Lavinia. She's almost like um, I think what Theo Van Gogh was to Vincent. She's sort of her rock and. Lavinia is there to sort of ground her and calm, soothe her in moments, and you start to understand. It gets you to empathize with why Emily became a recluse, and it's not because she's some crazy poet like the cliche would have done with, with most of these trite films, but she. The reason is is because she felt people were abandoning her and she would get close to people, be it female friends or uh, um, others she would correspond with and the women would go off and marry and they would eventually, you know, they would leave her and um, one of the characters in there is a minister and they call him Mr. Wadsworth and when I was watching it I was thinking, okay, I don't remember Mr. Wadsworth but his name was Wadsworth Higginson and there's a lot of Mr. Higginson in this journal where she was writing this minister who um, asking him what he thought of her poems and he was very favorable towards her like he seemed to really understand them and he was married and in the film it shows when he goes off and he has to move basically then she won't see him anymore and she's you know not going to hear from him very much anymore. I mean, she freaks out. She she because she becomes so attached to him, and the reason is, you know, not necessarily could it have been romantic. Certainly, I always thought that when I read the letters. But um, you know, she sort of when you're an artist and you're not appreciated, and you have someone understand your work and then that person leaves, it's very hard to let them go. And I could totally see that connection that she had. Um, you know, it's very painful 
in that sense. And so then when her father dies, she decides, you know, she goes into mourning and she wears white. And that was true with her life. And, and towards the end of her life, all she wore was white. And this was sort of her way of being in mourning. And then by the end, she really doesn't leave her room very much at all. And she becomes very embittered, not because she's a nasty person or a malicious lady or anything. She just, you can tell that she is someone who spends so much time alone that she starts to do this thing that, um, recluses can, can do is they start to push away those that are close to them and she she sort of there's there's lines about how you know she says posterity is really for those who weren't worth remembering in their lifetimes basically she's saying you know she didn't have much of a life but she wrote these poems and it's also you know one of the myths about her is that that she was sort of like that she just wrote anonymously and didn't want anyone to know her work and that's not true because she was publishing some that wasn't a lot but she published some she would send them to mr higginson and other people for feedback and she was also after you know she was um she would go back and rewrite them and make them more for clarity and so she was definitely presenting her manuscripts as like completed she wanted them to be done and found and she would tie them up in little bows and things like that like so she took great care of her um of her poems and i, I would like to it, it would nice be nice a little bit more to see not just some of the creative process but after the fact after her life what happened to her poems i mean they the first book was published in 1890 and that was I think just you know published among her family and then um, it was uh, published again in the 1930s and they totally you know gutted them they made them more conventional and they altered her 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 style or syntax and things like that and then it wasn't until the 50s they came out with this this is the complete poems this is how she intended them to be and you see she wrote quite a bit um, and she died at 56, age 56, because she, I think that she developed some uh, kidney disease. And the film goes into that. Um, very, very witty film. It's very humorous. Um, you, you know, it's not necessarily, I think, how people would have spoken back then. But in, in that sense, the film is a bit staged in a way. But I think it succeeds very well. I have not seen a, a film on a writer that was so um, that was so well developed as this. Not just for Emily, but the secondary characters. Like literally, you get to know Austin and Lavinia and what they were like. It's not just about her because when I've seen, you know I enjoy obviously I enjoy films on writers, but when a lot of times when they do films on writers they sort of perpetuate the stereotype or the cliche and they just sort of use characters to move plot forward and a good example of this in that film Sylvia Sylvia Plath she sticks her head in the oven by the end she commits suicide and you don't really understand why I mean yes you know that Ted left her for another woman but you don't get any sense of the other woman the woman he left her for um, in the film she has like two you know she's not in the film very much you don't understand who she is you don't understand their relationship it's just propelling plot so it's surface level and that you know I've seen that film a lot but I, I, I know it's not a good film this is a much better film um, a quiet passion is what it's called and it really you know I just don't know I don't know why it didn't get more attention I just happened to stumble upon it and just to finish up, you know, Emily Dickinson is known to have been a five-wing four. So um, she's very much, when you have the four-wing five and the five-wing four, they're sort of like this, this, this obvious sort of death interest, interest in death. And that's a lot of her poetry is about the afterlife, immortality, and death. And, and um, she, but she had this kind of method of coping with involving detachment where she detached that's why she became a recluse because people left her she felt abandoned and you know she never married and so 
she was viewed as kind of an eccentric person and um, the film does a very sympathetic job in, in understanding her, not painting her as sort of this crazy person, which she wasn't. She was just trying to cope. And she is very much a head type, I can see, a five wing four. Um, she, she just has that sort of, like I said, that coping mechanism of detachment. And honestly, I've, I've dealt with that too. Sometimes I feel like I can get too attached to people and then so I withdraw. And for me personally, I felt like this film really hit um, on a personal level. And it's, um, it was just nice revisiting, revisiting her because like I said, I mean, I think sometimes Emily Dickinson is one of those poets that you can kind of take for granted because you kind of always knew she's been around and you learn her young and you kind of, Emily Dickinson is a poet you learn when you're young and you kind of move on a little bit because um, there's no slight against her, but she is in a sense her own literary end leaf. And so like when I was very young and I was a teenager, I was actually writing poems that were imitative of her. So I would do the dashes and the weird kind of vocabulary and stuff. And that was just practice, but in this in this journal, it's it's interesting. I mean, if you want, if you do want to know more about Dickinson, I mean, now you could find this online, probably a lot cheaper than what I paid for it. I, I think I paid like eighteen dollars or something. Yes, eighteen dollars exactly. This is eighteen dollars in like nineteen ninety three. That's a lot of money. So that was a lot of babysitting money. Um, and also, of course, her poems, because these are very much a step stool for understanding, like, I remember the first time I ever read a Dickinson poem. I was young, I was like maybe 13, and this before I even got into poetry. Honestly, I was like, I didn't understand what she was talking about, because she was speaking something about sweeping the sky with a broom, and I was thinking it too literally, and I was like, I don't... What is that? But I remember I sat down and said, okay, I'm gonna understand this. And I kept rereading it. I go, I'm gonna figure this out. And then once I got the connection, I was like, okay, now I'm understanding. Like, just because she puts two images next to each other, they're, they're implied, their meanings are implied. She um, hints at a lot of things. So it does take a bit of intuition to figure out what she's saying, but it's, I find her poems very easy to understand, certainly now. Um, with all the practice and and um, it was oh, it was just nice to revisit revisit her and I think one of my favorite poems the one she writes about uh, the Civil War and um, she just just discusses um, she talks about dead soldiers and she talks about them lining up and she calls them even feet with uniforms of snow and she just had a very interesting way of viewing the world and that you could you could see the world like this and you don't have to leave Amherst she did not leave Amherst her entire life I mean she was happy where she was and um, so I very much recommend that film my friends my writer friends who know I study the Enneagram make fun of me because they think it's kind of silly and I understand it's not your thing but what I'm trying to do and what I've been trying to do these past few years is really being open open-minded to new things that's why I think about the Enneagram as a type of personality guide different types of self-growth I mean sometimes I'll listen to the Dalai Lama when he does live streams just because it's something that 10 years ago I never would have considered and seeing this film and how she reacted you know when Mr. Higginson or Wadsworth left and she's so attached to him you know it was very hard for me I mean I've had someone that I knew who supported my work but this person you know ended up being not who I thought they were they were actually you know um, a narcissist and they had um, pathological lying that they were doing and it was just it was very hard to take that it's as an artist artists get very attached I think to those who understand their work and um, re w w whatever it is whether whatever reason that they have to leave or they they you don't hear from them is is, is hard to take and now, of course, though, had Emily lived in our day now, she certainly would have communicated on Skype, had a Facebook page and YouTube and done her, done her videos because she was very, she liked to reach out to people. She just was reclusive 
personally. And I can understand that, you know, I'm sort of somewhat like that. And, but I guess that's all I gotta say. So I was glad to touch base with Emily. Here is this diary of Emily Dickinson and the complete poems of Emily Dickinson and check out that film. Um, I'm wearing sunglasses because it's actually really sunny, but then the sun went down and it was warm and it's Thanksgiving weekend and it's funny because I have no sense of what day it is. I keep thinking it's Saturday. No, it is Saturday, but I keep thinking it's Sunday and I'm okay with that, but it's just strange. Anyway, so I hope everyone's doing well. I'll, um, I'll have more in touch um, pretty soon and that's all I can think for right now. So um, that's about it. Have a pleasant weekend. Bye.